take a photograph of where you are at your home, uh, of the stream or the, the, the people that are gathered in your home, and then post that on social media with the hashtag COTC at home. C-O-T-C A-T-H-O-M-E. A bunch of people have already started doing that. It's just another way to use technology to help the invisible become a little more visible and allow us to have a sense that there are people meeting all over our city right now and engaging with us at church. He's alive. 
house without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart, my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, when death was arrested, my life began. Let's go on and sing this out. Let's say, oh, your grace. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love. You say yes. It's your endless love. Say, release from my chains, release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. Yeah, my shame was a ransom. You say, my shame was a ransom. He faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. That's when death. Sure. 
Well, good morning, friends. Happy Easter. I'm going to wave to you like I always do. Want to see you wave back? Nice. Thank you. This is probably my favorite Sunday of the year because this Sunday is all about the greatest news you will ever hear. So today, we are going to hear about the seventh I am statement of Jesus, which is, I am the resurrection and the life. And what resurrection means is coming back from the dead, coming alive again. And so today, I want to tell you the best story you'll ever hear. And to do that, I have some pages with me, and you'll notice if you printed out your activity sheets that they match so we can follow along together, okay? So here is the beginning of our story. Everyone has sinned. Everyone, you, me, we have all sinned. Do you know what sin is? Sin is something that hurts God's heart. God is perfect and he's holy and he doesn't have sin. Have you ever disobeyed your mom or dad or maybe been unkind to someone or maybe just kind of pouted because you wanted your own way? All of that is sin. So everyone has sinned. Who has sinned? Everyone, right. So because of sin, that means that we are separated from God. So if this is God, with all of his glory and his perfectness and his holiness, now there's a crack between us who have sinned, everyone, and God. God can't be near sin because he's perfect. So what are we supposed to do? Well, Sin has hurt God's heart. Have you ever had somebody hurt your feelings? You know, kind of that, that pain you get inside when your feelings are hurt? It's the same with God. When we do things that are wrong, it hurts his heart. And since he can't be near sin, there has to be a plan. The Bible says that the punishment for sin is death. You know, if you're anything like my kids, they have punishments for things if they do things wrong, like maybe I'll take their phone or maybe they have to go to their room. Have you ever had that? Yeah. Well, for God, the punishment for sin is death. And does that mean that you and I have to pay that? Well, here's the good news. God had a plan. He had a solution for the problem of sin. And that solution was who? Jesus, that's right. Jesus, God's son, was sent into the world. He was born in a manger. You know what season we celebrate that in? What season? Christmas. And then Jesus grew up and he had many disciples and he did miracles and he healed people. But did you know Jesus came for one reason into the world? And he knew what that reason was before he ever came. Jesus knew he was coming to die. He knew that he was coming to pay the price for all the wrong things that we have done. All of that sin. Here's the thing. The payment for sin had to be made by a perfect person. And Jesus was perfect. So he obeyed his father. He came into the world for you and for me. He died on a cross with a crown of thorns on his head. And when he died, he was obeying his father. When he died, he paid for the sin of every single person who would believe in him. But you know what? Here's the best thing about Easter. Jesus did not stay dead. He rose 
three days after he went into the tomb, after he had died on the cross for the sin of the world, God brought him back to life. He literally walked out of a tomb. He was alive again. This is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. We celebrate that Jesus is not dead anymore, that he is alive. Here's the best part. When you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and you put your trust in him and you say, yes, Jesus, I want to live with you forever. The crack between you and God and me and God goes away. And then we are able to live with Jesus forever because Jesus is alive. Now, here's what I want to say to you on Easter Sunday. If you have questions about what it means to trust Jesus as your savior, if you have questions about what it means to be with God forever, I want you to ask the person that you live with. Ask your mom or your dad, ask your grandparents, ask an adult or maybe an older brother or sister who can help you know how you can have a relationship with Jesus forever. We celebrate Easter because Jesus is alive. Happy Easter. We come back together and sing the power of the resurrection over our lives this morning. We declare this truth that Christ is eternally risen from the grave, a conqueror of sin and death. Sin remain inside the lion. Inward shame, we fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him. Show great love and bless for us. Freely you bless for. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave.
Well, happy Easter, everyone. You know that Easter Sunday is pretty much every pastor's favorite Sunday. Uh, people are dressed up to the nines. Uh, the place is packed. We have overflow space. Uh, there is so much energy in the house. Well, today, Easter Sunday feels a little bit different than that. You know we're going to remember this Easter Sunday, Easter 2020, for the rest of our lives. Um, I think we're going to remember it for a whole bunch of reasons. But let me just say this. I may be preaching to an empty room, but it's still about an empty tomb. Do you get that? That's preaching, folks, right there. Yeah, can I get an amen? There's a chorus of amens going on in my head right now, and there are crickets in the room, but there are amens in my head, and I appreciate that. You know, since AD 400, Christians on every continent of the world have had a certain practice on Easter Sunday. And uh, you know what it is. It's called the Paschal Greeting. For about 1,600 years, people have been doing this. And it comprises of two statements. The first one is, He is risen. And then the person responding says, He is risen indeed. Yeah, and then this is often followed by three kisses on the cheeks. Now, um, like many things in this era, we've had to adapt and innovate and adjust. And we're going to do the Paschal greeting quarantine style today, okay? So this is what I want you to do. I want you to text, he is risen to someone in our church. Maybe it's people that you normally sit around. Uh, maybe it's people that you know of. But I want you just to text randomly right now. Grab your phone right now and text, he is risen. And then they're going to respond with, he is risen indeed. And then you are both confronted with what to do on the whole kiss thing. It could be the kiss emoji. It could be lips. It could be X's or it could just be nothing. Okay. And I'm just going to leave that to you right now. So grab your phone and do the Paschal greeting uh, quarantine style this week. All right. You can do that. Take a second to do that. All right. All right. So we started a series seven weeks ago on the seven I am statements of Jesus. Seven weeks ago feels more like years ago now. Uh, the current global health crisis is clearly the most disruptive event of our lifetime. And we've all had moments of fear and uncertainty and disbelief. And that's okay. I want you to give yourself some grace it's understandable that we need to take a moment to adjust to this season. But we know that this season will pass and it will give way to something that is new. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time, Jesus said seven statements, all beginning with the words, I am. And they're all recorded in the Gospel of John. The seventh and final statement we're going to be looking at today and it is found in John 11. Now, here in this scene, we have three of Jesus' closest friends. Uh, two sisters named Mary and Martha, and then their brother named Lazarus. Now, you may remember Mary and Martha from Luke chapter 10. There's a whole scene there where Jesus visits the house, and Mary and Martha are there together. Martha is busy preparing the meal and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha is mad that she is doing all the work. Siblings fighting over household chores. Can anyone relate to this? We're spending more time right now at home than I think ever before. Uh, I have three daughters that are 13, 11 and 9. This week our dishwasher broke. Yeah, now I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but I think that my daughters in their entirety have never washed dishes by hand. So uh, after the, we found that the dishwasher broke, I handed each one of my girls a dishcloth and I said, we used to have one dishwasher, now we have three. And I had this conscious thought as these words came out of my mouth. I have officially become my parents. In John 11, 
Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus is sick from an unknown illness and his health rapidly deteriorates and he dies. And Jesus shows up here in verse 17. It says this, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, here's an important detail in the text. In the ancient world, they did not have the advanced medical practices that we have today. There are several ancient sources that record that when people were put into tombs, uh, sometimes there were occasions where they weren't actually dead. They thought that they were dead and they weren't. There was this, there's a, a historic document that records the fact that there was one guy who ended up walking out of the tomb several days later and he went on to father five more children. So to avoid this, the Jewish people would stand at the entrance of a tomb for the first three days and they would call out the person's name. They would call out their name to see if that they would come. Now, uh, the Jews also believed that the soul hovered around the body for the first three days. But the text says here that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days in, it was clear, Lazarus was dead. Interesting, interestingly, when both uh, Mary and Martha see Jesus for the very first time, they say the same thing. They use the same phrase. They see him separately, but they use the same phrase. It's recorded in verse 21 and in verse 32. They say this, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. These two sisters are grieving the loss of their brother who died from this unknown sickness. And both of them are looking at Jesus and saying, where were you? Can anyone relate to this? I have some friends who overall had a terrible 2019 and on New, Year, New Year's Eve they were saying to everyone goodbye 2019 bring on 2020 and if we only knew in this scene we have two of Jesus closest friends feeling forgotten let down abandoned when they needed Jesus the most. Maybe you feel a little bit like this in this season that we're in. Lord, if you'd been here, we wouldn't be facing a global health pandemic, a potential financial crisis, lost jobs, foreclosures, financial ruin, crushed small businesses, pressure on relationships, shattered dreams or destroyed hope. You know, generally speaking, the gap between one's hope and one's reality is disappointment. And this is a scene of two people disappointed by God. If you've experienced significant pain in your life, abuse or betrayal or abandonment or loss, maybe you can relate to these words. Lord, if you'd been there, this pain would not have happened. And both of these sisters say the same thing to Jesus, but Jesus responds differently to each of them. And I believe that these two responses are maybe the thing that God wants to say to us in this season, this Easter. Firstly, let's look at the response to Mary. Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. How does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond to the pain that is in our lives? Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Deeply moved in the original language, in the original Greek literally means to groan with rage. One scholar believes that the translators were afraid of saying that Jesus was angry or he was enraged. So they used instead the words he was deeply moved or troubled. How does Jesus respond? Well, he responds with the shortest verse in the entire 
Bible. New Testament, Old Testament, the entire Bible. Two words, verse 35, Jesus responds, Jesus wept. Now, if you know this story, you know that Jesus goes on to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he does this by going to the front of the tomb and calling out his name on the fourth day. This, of course, was a foreshadow to his own resurrection, to the resurrection of Jesus. But we typically read these stories in reverse. We, we know what's going to happen. We know that Lazarus is going to come back from, uh, from the dead. And so we, we, we kind of read it without the, 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 the unknown, without the tension, without the emotion in this. Now, let me ask you this. If you knew what was going to happen, if you knew that in less than 10 minutes, Lazarus would be alive again, I, I, I'm just imagining what I would do. Um, if you knew that there was going to be celebration and amazement and joy, would you be weeping with them? I'd be looking at them and thinking, you just wait. It's about to get good. I'd be hiding my smile because of what was about to happen. Why would Jesus, knowing what was about to happen, enter into the grief? What does this reveal about the heart of God? Even though all the pain was about to be undone, Jesus wept. We began this series by asking, what is God like? How does God think? How does he act? What are his thoughts and attitudes? What are the kinds of things that he says? Well, Colossians 1 says that the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Image in the original Greek is the word icon. It means a depiction or portrait. Jesus is the icon, the perfect portrait of God. What is God like? He is exactly like Jesus. So where is God when you're in pain? Where is God when you're disappointed or anxious or afraid? What is God's response? He weeps. What is God's response to the impact of the global coronavirus pandemic? He weeps. Jesus soothes Mary's pain by weeping with her, by comforting her with sympathy and with empathy. So maybe you hear this and you think, so why doesn't God do something about this? Well, the answer to that is in this text. And the answer is, he has. You see, the second response to the same words, when Martha said the same thing, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. This time Jesus' response was different. Verse 23, he said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. The seventh statement Jesus gives about himself, the seventh portrait that he gives of himself, uh, the words, I am the resurrection and the life. What Jesus is saying here is that there is pain in the world, but this world is not the end. There is something so much bigger that is going on here. Jesus wants to soothe the pain of sin, but he has also solved the power of sin. He has broken the stronghold of sin and defeated death. The Bible says the greatest problem that you will ever have has been solved for you. The problem of sin has been solved through his death on the cross and his resurrection. Jesus has solved the greatest problem that you will ever have. What would Jesus say to us this Easter? 
He came to soothe and solve. Soothe the pain of sin and solve the power of sin. The current global pandemic shatters our confidence and exposes what we have built our lives on. What is our foundation? What do we cling to when we are afraid or anxious? What do we trust when everything seems to be shaking? Jesus weeps with us in our pain. He comforts us in our fears. But he also offers a foundation that far surpasses this season, this new cycle, this crisis moment. This is not the end. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. A couple of weeks ago, I had a dream that was so real. Have you ever had a dream that was so real that when you wake up, it, you just absolutely believe the details of this dream? I had a dream that one of my daughters died. And it was the single most vivid dream of my life. It's just a couple of weeks ago. And I woke up just grieving the loss of my daughter. And then as I slowly started to come around with more and more consciousness, I realized that it was a dream. Uh, I was traveling at the time, and so I wasn't with my family. And I called my daughter when, uh, this is sort of the middle of the night, and so when, when, the, when the morning came, I called my daughter. And the dream was so vivid to me that when I heard her voice, I started to weep because I felt so deeply the loss of, of, of my little girl. The waves of relief came upon me because what I thought was true was not true. You know, there's this scene in The Lord of the Rings, there's this moment where Samwise Gamgee, the hobbit, thinks that his mentor, Gandalf, had died. And then when he sees him, he's so surprised. And he looks at him and he says, is everything sad going to come untrue? What a question. Is everything sad going to come untrue? The answer of Jesus to this question is yes. The answer of the Bible is yes. If the resurrection is true, then the answer is yes. Everything sad is going to come untrue. Revelation 21 says, this is the end here. It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is where hope lies for millions of Christians around the world. Even in the midst of of a global health crisis. Our hope is in the resurrection. It's in the name of Jesus. You know, it's believed that the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic in our city will be this week. You know, it is not lost on me that the moment of greatest crisis is colliding with the moment of greatest hope. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Let me ask you the same question that Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? This Easter, Easter of 2020, do you believe this? Mary's response is in verse 27. And she says, yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is to come into the world. 
You know, the source of hope for the Christian is this. This is not the end. Jesus came to soothe the pain of sin and to solve the power of sin. Do you believe this? We're going to close with a song that is about hope. And then uh, when this song is done, I'm going to come and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And then I'll close out our service together. So take a listen to this. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher. With power to say, with power to say, oh. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive. together by praying and I want to just ask you wherever you are if you would just close your eyes right now maybe you'll bow your head or do whatever you feel comfortable would you just close your eyes I just want to have a moment of reflection and a moment of prayer uh, as we get ready to close our service for Easter of 2020 two groups of people that I'm thinking of some of you are in a lot of pain right now and I want to pray that you would experience Jesus himself, the presence of Jesus himself coming to soothe your pain. Some of you are wrestling with anxiety and fear. There are some circumstances that you're dealing with right now in this season right now. And I just wanna pray the presence of God into your situation that the presence of Jesus would soothe you that you would feel his sympathy, his empathy, that you would feel him weeping with you as maybe you're in a season of weeping. But there's a, a second group, and that's those that would say, um, I need to make sure that my trust is in Jesus. He has solved the power of sin. He has solved this for good. This is not the end. And I want to invite you in this unusual time, the, the, the most unusual time of our lifetime, 
that you would actually be turning your attention to heaven and you would be saying, God, I invite you to come and lead my life. I want to accept and believe. Do as, as Martha said. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. That you would say, yes, Lord. So let's pray together. God, first of all, I want to pray for those who are in a season of pain or anxiety or stress or worry for whatever reason. Lord, you know the specific details of what they're dealing with right now. And I pray that we would experience you again to be soothing those who are hurting. That they would find you with empathy and with sympathy. That they would find your presence near that you would be weeping with those who are weeping. And we're amazed, God, that you enter into that even though you know how this is all going to turn out. And so I, I pray for those, God, who are looking to you right now and saying, yes, Lord, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin that you were buried and then you rose from the dead and that the tomb is empty with resurrection power. That is what we celebrate on this Sunday, that you would be someone that is saying, yes, Lord. Lord, I pray for all of those people who are saying, yes, Lord, maybe for the first time or maybe those who are coming back and saying that this season has exposed um, where my foundation is, and I want to shore up my foundation. I want to shore up my trust that you came to soothe and you came to solve. Lord, I pray that as there are people that are just inviting you to come and lead their lives, God, I pray that you would show your presence to them. And we pray this in the name of the risen Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. If you made a decision today and uh, you're with family members or whatever, I want you just to tell them. Just tell them, hey, I, you know, I made a decision just to ask God to come soothe me right now. Or I made a decision to just say, yes, Lord, Jesus, come and lead my life. Uh, I would encourage you to, to let people know that. If you don't feel comfortable with the people that you're around, then, then text someone, let them know. And we want to celebrate with you. Uh, I want to I wanna close with the Paschal greeting in the most traditional sense. I'm going to say he is risen. And then you guys are going to respond. He is risen indeed in all of your homes across our city. Here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, everyone. God bless you.